I want to welcome the big homie Damien Cash into the Shy Ill Reacts universe. Hello, hello, hello. What's up? What's up, Shy Ill? How you doing, Ooh. brother? What's popping, man? How are you? Nothing much. I guess this has been long overdue. We've been meaning to do this for a while. Long overdue indeed, bro. Maybe uh, uh, decades. You know what I'm yes, saying? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Maybe decades. Um, I know we've never really crossed paths, but we have a lot of like connections in the music, like nonstop, and I'm sure like Boogie and you know all all of the legendary music people, you know. And that's I think like uh, my focus here, right? Um, I was I you know I was making money, like I mean obviously not uh, Twin or Cato money, but I was doing pretty well for myself, you know. I was. I was making a, a, a cool mill every year off of mixtapes for a good three or four year run, you know? Um, so I was somebody that was established and kind of, that's where the crosshairs of this all meets, right? Is music and the streets, they, they always have like, a, they're like cousins, you know? So um, that's what got me around a lot of these guys and, and you know, beyond them, I, I'm known like on every side, you know, like I, you know, I, uh, I I'm neutral um you know I have a lot of ties and have a lot of friends in in the mob but you know I'm neutral you know I I money's been green for me on every side so I I've, I've always been able to maneuver everywhere I go you know because of that Was that a conscious you know I know you, you grew up in Chicago you were born here Yeah yeah born and born and raised on uh, on the west side on Monticello and Augusta uh raised to like third or fourth grade uh like north avenue in cicero um but then majority of my life i was raised in like garfield uh gauge park you know what i'm saying so like 55th you know midway area uh so navigating gang turf as like even though i wasn't in gangs you know was that a conscious something. decision was that a con as a young man you know we we grow up in this in this city and and it's part of the culture in many ways and and you know was that a a conscious decision of listen that's not for me yeah no i it, it never really like i never needed that you know like um i was always a relationship person so it's really like the individual like when you think of the big picture here like i had a direct connection with with the flores brothers they were friends of mine so we played basketball together um you know they rocked with me i had my own money they had their own money i had my own cars they had their own cars and i was like a peer you know what i'm saying so i'm not saying on their on their level but i was somebody that yo, I share this restaurant with you. Come eat over here, come eat over there, you know? Um, obviously, we're talking early on in their, in their, in their start of things, you know? But uh, same thing with Cato. We were just, we just gravitated towards the music, you know? We linked uh, on the music tip. Yeah, no, because I always wonder that, you know, coming up in the city, like, you know, when, you, when you're a teenager, there's mad pressures out there. You're walking from hood to hood. You're dealing with all this shit in this city. And, you know, a lot, it's hard for a lot of people to not fall to it. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I mean, I was just having a conversation about this with my girls this morning about, like, the great lengths that parents go to, right? Like, my mom was desperate trying to get me into a Catholic school. Um, that didn't work out. So I ended up in public school. But I don't think that that is really the determining factor. I just think that if it's predispositioned in you to 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 look for that you know that brotherhood and 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 look for love in in in, in certain places that you don't get at home or you're not getting in life in general then that's just going to be your life you know it just and it's and it's different in the dynamics of every child within every you know every family right like sometimes marriages fall apart on the second or third kid the first and second kid they went off to college you <laughs> went to good schools and then shit falls apart and then you got to go have you you know you're dealt a different deck of cards so i just think you know the way the cards lied i was around a, a a good a good bunch of friends in 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 grammar school even i was a you know i was a dancer and then all through high school i was a tennis player and a dj so like my ambitions were different than like street dreams in the beginning you know um what what ends up happening to me is that like as my as the cd 
started to dissipate and it and and, and the, the cd game or the distribution game that i was heavily in started to decline and come these group of friends that were very wealthy and and affluent in the street business and it was an easy decision for me to make because it wasn't that hard to attain a connect or attain work or or attain trust they're like oh hey come work for us make these rounds do this this that and the third introduce you to this guy introduce you to that guy which is where like peter said you know he was the first person that introduced me to kate like that's how it all kind of unraveled and then it was like music was like the story in the background of everything for this you know like i was actually in the music business i actually dj'd i actually did make money off of music and the dream was always to have a record label and then those things kind of like merged and became everyone's ambition as the way out of whatever it is we were doing on the street yeah i think that helps too i think i think when a person has something else a lot of these kids that fall to the trap they didn't they don't have something else you know and then there's a lot of us that we find early in life the thing that's ours and again for you it was music for me it was music like at what age did you know, like, this is what I'm going to do? This is what I want to do. I want to do music. Um, I think it was my first really, my first love. You know, my uncle was a party promoter. So, like, since 1986 or 87, I was ripping cellophane tapes open and pumping them in a, you know, in a pullout radio and just, like, listening to nwa for the first time and Yo, you know just that, like that story there that that nwa that straight out of compton that was a big deal for me because i remember you know i had a brother that was 10 years older than me and i remember finding a black cassette that had the the the, the paper ripped off of it you know what i'm saying right, right. just a, a indistinct and i put it in and that shit said you are yeah. now about to witness the strength the street knowledge changed yes, my sir. life forever though. um you know i had a dance group and some kids used to get bust into my to my dance group. And, you know, I was in a predominantly white, then slightly Mexican neighborhood in the South Side. So I would have kids of all colors coming to my to my garage to practice dance routines and things for parties and talent shows and such. And I didn't quite understand it when I first heard the words, fuck the police, you know, after police, you know, um, I knew it moved something in me and I knew that there was something right about it. And then like not even a year later, I started to witness what it what that really meant. Cause I'm walking to my garage where I have my music set up, my dad, my mom, nobody's home yet. I they could I could use the garage up until everyone gets home from work. So I got a couple hours after school to bring my friends over and they're friends of all colors, right? And they would just stop us and we're heading to go dance practice we're not even in a gang so you know it's 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 crazy the emotion that nwa evoked in the hood with those songs and, and you're now about to witness the strength you know like you didn't know what that strength was nah, i didn't know until, what the hell like, they was you talking went about through it, you know absolutely absolutely you felt it it was yeah it was different different yeah. times and I appreciate your show, man, you know, for whatever it is that you're doing and how, how like, neutral you are, you know. Um, but, you know, I really am on here. I, you know, I've been confused as a as a as a street person, as I as I was, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm not a street person, but I'm rooted in music. That's the beginnings of my hustle is music. You know, I just picked up hustling because it was like the only thing that was parallel to the, you know, the, the effect of the money that I was making, you know? Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people misconstrue me and think Zodogowski like, oh, I'm this, you know, on YouTube. this gangster or I'm, I'm, I'm part of the mob or I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just me, you know, I'm just fortunate to have lived a like legendary story, still be alive to tell it and have met some like whatever you know put all the telling aside or or everything that goes on like there's not that many people that get to say like yo i'm part of that story you know like my friends were involved with uh, there's not that many people that could say that they were involved with chop you know what i'm saying um there's not that many people that could say like yo i was the right hand man to a very high ranking uh, uh, Latin King, and and we were about to be signed to a multi-million dollar deal with DreamWorks. 
You know, uh, I'm not here to discredit nobody, take nobody's legacy, move nobody's legacy, or make any money off of anybody's legacy. Any money I made off of music, I made it out of my trunk. And my man saw that. He saw my passion. And our passions met. And we decided to, like, go for it, you so know? you guys Balls were all, all in each other's peripherals at the time that you, you slanging tapes. You're all in each other's peripherals. You're running the same circles, right? Yep. And, and and the music is is evidently still working for you at the time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm and, in and out of mixtapes in the street. Like I'm dibbling, dabbling. Like I'm I'm jumping in and out of both worlds, trying to still do music, trying to still consult and run the label while I'm you know running and learning how to run the streets. You know, like there's not that many people that could say, "Yo, Cato taught me everything I know." You now, know, did like, you did you know K before you knew the Flores twins? Like, how did you meet each? How did you meet? No, K? I I, I knew twins? of him, but I had never met him. I you know I used to when things didn't go well for me at the discount mall, and I you know didn't have a good day selling tapes, or I didn't have a good day distributing. I was like, you know, Twenty Sixth Street was a, a no cruising zone, but it really was a cruising zone. So literally, cars were like two three miles per hour you know, stuck in traffic. So I would post up on Sawyer, I think, with uh, my boy Louie, who was a Latin King, and my guy Oscar, who was like, not a Latin King, but affiliated to them. And I would just stand there with like the stand that was like, you know, selling aguas and, and, and elotes and stuff. And I would just bump into cars and run into cars and just be like, yo, I got the, the freshest, you know, mixes. And that's how I would know of who they were, you know, through the neighborhood was like, they would buy my tapes, buy my CDs, you know, I would always, of course, go up to, um, you know, the, the dopest cars, you know, and that just so happened to be, you know, the biggest vans, the flyest vans with the biggest rims and the, that and who was in those vans, you know, the guys running the neighborhood, which happened to be, you know, Florida brothers, the, 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 the twins, I, you know, a, a lot of people don't really know. I also knew Cowboy. I sold Cowboy his first mixtapes. You know, Cowboy was a Trumbull 2-5 and, and a big ranking guy. He got caught before all these guys. Like, I set his first music store up in the Hollywood car wash. Like, I got extensive ties and backgrounds all the way back. You know, it's really crazy, like, the shit and how it all works out. But, like, I even know Saul, who then later on, you know, does all this shit to the twins. But I've had dealings with Saul, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I know of him. He knows of me, you know. He never got he uh, never got you for nothing? Nah, you know, he was always on, you know, stick up time, robin time. So, you know, I knew a couple of people that were part of his crew, you know, and sometimes I'd tag along and be like, man, you want to make some extra money, come hang with us. We're gonna go do this and that and a third. And you know, sometimes it was fruitful and a lot of times it was not, you know what I'm saying? So like I, you know, and that and that was a couple, a handful of times. I'm not saying I was like a regular with them or around them. And that was probably like early on in his like, we're talking about 96, 97, 98. You know what I'm saying? Even 99 that I was like around, in and around that world, you know? Um, so all these guys own businesses and cell phone stores. Um, so... You know what? Where did you used to sell mixtapes yeah, at? It's obvious. All over this, all over you know, the like Twin uh, 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 P won't w didn't say it, but the first time I met him, it was in Hot Jams. He was working at Hot Jams, and I was like, "Yo, what the?" You know, I knew he was somebody in the neighborhood, and I'm like, "What's he doing? Oh, this is his front. This is his like cover up." You know, like, "All right, I'm not gonna blow it for you." And you know, and he was like, "What's up, man? How you doing?" You know, because he, he remembered me from the street, but he was also just trying to learn the business, see if maybe a record store was something he he would want to open later. You know, um, but I remember seeing him working at Hot Jams, and I mean, he could probably verify that for you. Um, but that's really my rounds in the city and my, my, like, I know people from Milwaukee and Waukegan all the way out to Gary and <laughs> Indianapolis, you know, in, in just like, you know, just off of mixtapes, man. So like, it's, it's just very extensive. You know, I used to ship to 14 States, bro. You know, like I, I had a, probably the biggest operation 
you know, they came and made an office here. Uh, the RIA built this office specifically to bust one, two guys. The guy bootlegging the Titanic movie and Damien Cash. Like, ev- that was their agenda. Go to every store, find Damien Cash product, build a case. And the shit that they were building on me was something I wasn't going to be able to come back from. It was like air, mail, wire fraud, racketeering. And you you saw know, it coming. like, uh, just all type of, sh- you know, like legal problems that I just I didn't even know I was doing simply by, you know, selling a mixtape, you know? Uh, but you know, it is what it is. You know, so you you uh, saw it coming, and what you just shut down shop. Yeah, I shook it, man. I just said, man, you know, I had a operation at like uh, the U was the U-Haul building now they call it, or the riverfront lofts they call them right by Lawrence's. I had like three thousand square feet. I used to hire a lot of undocumented like people to stuff CDs all day, very light work. And I would just give them, you know, $50 a day a person just to sit there, you know, stuff J cards and print CDs and, you know, wrap CDs. And, you know, I I had a a pretty large operation, bro. So when that came about, I went in there one night, slapped a chain around my excursion that I had around the time and pulled a dumpster to the windows. I was like on the seventh or eighth floor and I threw everything out. Somebody in the building gave me a heads up and said that they were going to serve a a knocking, you know, knocking warrant. I just bust in. And the next day they told me, hey, they came by with a warrant today. They said they were looking for you, but, you know, we don't have a lease with you. I had the lease in somebody else's name. So what that gave me the leg up, they went and go get their warrant under the right name with the hopes to find me there, then I just got rid of everything. And that was really the last time I ever really made a CD or a, a, a mixtape and just said, you know, you know, it's, it's crazy because everybody's like, well, how did you get involved in this? It was like, you know, that was that fork in the road, you know? Like, now, were you already, were you already playing on both sides or it was strictly, you know, tape? I knew people in the business and I would connect people all the time, like middleman shit but never like hands on, you know what I'm saying? Like I was just like, oh yeah, oh you need, oh I know who you get, oh talk to this guy right here, you know? I'll make a few dollars here and there and I was like, oh man, this is like lucrative, you know? But I never really relied on it or 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 focused on it until um, the mixtape game was completely like shut down. And, and, and that was sad because I did it to myself, right? I brought the uh, Jamaican and the Asian, they moved, they moved here from New York and they started a duplication center. And then the next thing I knew they were coming here, bringing DJ who kids CDs and all these unreleased mixtapes from New York that they were bootlegging and they were just undercutting me, selling it for a dollar or two for slim lines. And I was like, once they did that, they really just took the meat out of any profit I was making at four or $5, you know? 